is a, a session of uh, an hour and a half, so we have some time. There is a break in between, so you can escape somewhere in the middle if you want. <laughs> the, um, the idea was, uh, some of you will have seen some of the content, but most of it is new. The idea was that uh, place content is something that uh, isn't used very much by people where, where, well, we think that it should be used much more. And the reason it's not used very much is the learning curve is like exponential, uh, if you want. Because um, you, you have to master a whole, a whole uh, group of technologies at the same time. Uh, this is an, uh, an attempt, it's not the first attempt, but it's an attempt to make things a little bit, uh, a little bit easier on, uh, on all of you. This is the result of uh, doing professional services in, uh, for, for place content for a while, also to give some trainings on the subject and being forced to explain it. I mean, there's nothing so horrible than implementing something and then being forced to explain it to someone afterwards. Um, so we've, I've tried to come up with a number of improvements, and one is this, this GitHub uh, thing that uh, you'll see. That's one part, I think. The second is a way of explaining how this works to make a real-world example. You've already seen the example of uh, Marco that gave away. It's the, uh, the proof page uh, that will we'll build. Uh, by all means, if you have a computer with you, feel free to, to follow along or, or do things alongside uh, what I'm doing. I will not be offended if you work on your uh, computer. Even if I would be, you would do it anyway, so it doesn't change anything. Um, if you have questions, just ask. Don't try to save them until the end of the session. That's not going to work. Just speak up when you, uh, when you have one. Like I said, we have an hour and a half, so I, I will try not to go too quickly and I will try to explain everything in enough detail. If that doesn't work, then let me know. The first thing is, this is not rocket science. And uh, because we're... Um okay, come on. Yes, thank you. Because we're after lunch, I felt the need to include real rocket science for two minutes. That's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is much easier. But we're going to fail anyway. And that's the other part of this, uh, of the reason I wanted to show this is, if you fail a couple of times, 
there are others who have done the same, and their failures are a lot more expensive than the ones you can make in today's continent. Trust me. <laughs> I don't know the cost of a launch and the cost of one of those boosters, but it's, uh, I'm sure it's more than a couple million euros. So if they can do it, then we can do it too. So how do we get started with, uh, with place content? This is roughly what I want to cover. Um, starting with, uh, with GitHub and uh, explaining what we do, what we do at the moment with GitHub. Uh, I'm under no misconception that what we do at the moment is the best way to do it or the final way that it should be done. But I can at least show you where we are right now, and then uh, you can all tell me why it's wrong, and we'll try to come up with something better. Second thing is uh, templates for place content. There is a template, or less for place content. Basically, you can take one of the existing examples and then uh, throw away what you don't like and start from there. Uh, we've done, uh, an, I've created an attempt to have a better template <coughs> that you can start from. And I'll explain what that is and how that works. Then there is something called the place content lifecycle if you want, so what actually happens? And one of the reasons I put this in here is because every, every time I give training and I try to explain it to people, it's really hard because you have to explain everything at the same time. So I've tried to come up with a way of explaining how, how this place content fix-up works and how PDF Toolbox goes through the different steps. And hopefully that explains what you should do to get the result that you want at the end. And then there is an, uh, an example, this uh, proof page that uh, Mark already showed this morning that consists out of two steps, and we'll, uh, we'll attempt to, uh, to build that. If you want, you can, like I said, you can follow along by all means. Uh, we have some other people here that can uh, jump in and help. Uh, so feel free to <coughs> ask all kinds of difficult questions on things that don't work as we, as we do this. So the first thing is, uh, is GitHub, and I think if I remember my slides correctly, that we start with some terminology. <coughs> Who amongst you knows what version control is? Have you, who has worked with GitHub or Git? Usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably know more about it than I do because I've always very, I've always been very diligent in staying away from it. For, for some reason, my brain doesn't work with version control. Um, but uh, not make fun of that. I was kind of forced to do something with it now. So here is some terminology. Git is the underlying system. So Git is a is a piece of technology that is designed to um, to keep track of of what you do with code. Code can be basically almost anything. It's free, it's always good. It's open source, uh, which means you can uh, try to fix things if you uh, think that you know better. But the basic thing is that it, it keeps track of, of versions. So you can, you can have something uh, tracked so that after two months you still know which change you did at a particular date uh, it has technology that allows you to do rollbacks so that you can go back to a version that still works before you kind of messed it up. Uh, all of those, uh, all of those things. And GitHub is <coughs> the Git system itself that is already installed. So you could, you don't have to use GitHub. You could have the Git technology and then do with it whatever you want to do with it on your own system. But GitHub is kind of a ready-to-go package that uh, has its own website interface. I was going to say nice website interface, but there could be some debate about that. Um, but it's packaged, it's ready to go, so it's easy. And, uh, it ends up looking like this. So uh, you can create what they call uh, repositories, where you check in a bunch of uh, stuff. You can make multiple repositories. You can make repositories that are private so that only you can see them. You can make repositories that are public so that whatever is in there can be shared with the whole world. And 
lo and behold, that's what we did. Uh, so there is a uh, repository when you go to github.com slash 4 piece slash place contents, then you'll find uh, a GitHub repository that has some private contents, which you won't see, and it has some public contents, which you uh, will see. And if you go there, and um, it's actually, if you have your computer open, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do that. Uh, you get to see more or less this, I think. I don't think yet so that's the exact URL that uh, you have there. So this is what you get to see. And if you quickly want to do something with that or check out what is on there, the easiest way to do that is that clone or uh, download thing, the green, big green button. Clone or download lets you download whatever is in this repository to your own machine. There's software that you can install locally that can help you do this and do it automatically and so on. And I have some of that stuff installed. But uh, you can simply do it with a web browser. You go there, you click on that uh, green button, and that will start a download, or if you select download zip, that is, uh, it will either unzip it automatically or you unzip it, and that will give you a folder. In that folder are, at the moment, two things. So you can see that this repository is quite limited right now. There are only two things in it. One is a subfolder called underscore templates. That's the one that you're uh, basically after. And the other one is an example. Um, so if I go back there, you can probably see both of them. Uh, there is a, a thing there that is called add dimension arrows, SVG and there is something called underscore templates. Uh, one is the actual template, the other one is an example using the templates. This add dimension arrows is something that was also already released as a default fix up in one of the libraries for PDF Toolbox. Uh, the one you find here is better. Uh, a, it fixes <coughs> bugs that are in the version of PDF Toolbox and B, uh, the only thing we did was draw arrows. Now there is also measurement in space between the arrows. So it's a little bit of an improved version of uh, the fix-up. The important thing is you have that, that thing online so you can, you can download it. Of course, because this is a version control system, you could also go back in, in and look at the history and see what <laughs> has changed in this thing. If I um, make a fix to this and I upload it to the repository, you can download the new code quite easily. So that means there is a master version of that template from this point of view. It's what you find there. <coughs> Likewise, if you download this and you find a bug in there, which will highly surprise me, <laughs> um, you can fix it. And you can do what is called a pull request, which means that you actually give us the code and say, have a look at this and why don't you integrate this into the master version because it fixes a problem or it adds something that is interesting for more people. And then whoever is in control of this uh, repository, which at the moment is uh, <coughs> me, whoever is in control of that can decide to integrate that code that you supply in there, which means that it becomes available for everyone else who's using it. So that's the basic idea behind this. You can see that it's very rudimentary at the moment. It's also kind of strange to have this as a four-piece um, repository, but that's better. That means we can do whatever we want with this, and whatever we think that it works, it could be migrated to the uh, a Kalas repository, for example. At the moment, this is what you'll, uh, what you'll find <coughs> online there. So, brings us to the templates. What is in there? Well, if you, if you download that and you unzip it, you will end up with this folder structure, hopefully. And you find some different parts in there. And I want to briefly comment on what all of these things are, because this is a little bit changed from what you find in the examples um, so far. Um, the first thing that I'll mention is actually the second thing on this slide, just for the measure. It's a thing called readme.md. Uh, MD stands for markdown, which is a type of marked up uh, text file. 
Um, this is just a readme that explains what the template is and basically gives the same explanation as what I'll uh, talk about here. The main file of the template is, of course, this index.html. Yeah. Um, index.html is the, the HTML file that is converted into a, uh, into a PDF. That's still the same as it uh, was before. Then you have a manifest.xml that's not present in all of the examples that uh, we've created so far. I've, I've chosen to include it in uh, this template because it's often useful. Um, this manifest.xml is a communication file with PDF toolbox if you want. In that manifest.xml you can ask for some stuff that PDF toolbox will then do as it runs your base content fixer. And we'll go into a little bit more detail what, uh, what that means, but just so you know what that file uh, is. And then you have a number of uh, folders in there. The first one, Kalas underscore temp, is one that is created automatically by PDF Toolbox. Whenever your uh, place content fix up is <laughs> run, PDF Toolbox will replace it will either create this uh, Kalas temp folder if it doesn't exist yet, or simply use it if it does exist. But it will replace the files that are in there, uh, which means that it would not be smart to, put to, to, to change those files. That those are really modified by PDF Toolbox itself. Again, I'll uh, explain in a little bit more detail why and how that, uh, that happens. The second one is, um, or the second and the third one are the ones that you have under control. And I've split that in two uh, because you have two types of, if you think about using a template like this, uh, you really have two types of content. You have the content that is specific to a particular project or to something that you are implementing. And you have the content that is given to you by the templates, JavaScripts, fonts, uh, CSS files, that are downloaded from this, uh, this repository, this GitHub <laughs> repository, and that you don't really want to change. Those are the things that are uh, the library that you get uh, if, you, uh, if you want. So the reason that you'll find JavaScripts in there and you'll also find JavaScripts in the folder called scripts is because the scripts that you have in this folder are the ones that you have under control and that you will modify to do whatever you want to do in the project. The JavaScripts that live under Kalas library normally are JavaScripts that you probably don't want to modify. The only reason to modify them is the highly unlikely event that there is a problem with one of those JavaScripts and that you have to fix it. Um, and then if you fix it, as I said before, you could upload it to GitHub again and uh, integrate that fix so that others can benefit of it as well. Does that make sense? I hope so, because otherwise we're in trouble for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I have no idea how long this is going to take, by the way. So I have to keep uh, a little bit of an eye on uh, I actually don't, don't know when I started, which doesn't help, but anyway, okay. Base content lifecycle. This is one of the things that, like I said, that is kind of difficult to explain because there is a lot going on when you run this. And it's important to understand what PDF Toolbox does, in what order it does it, and, uh, and so on. And it's actually, um, well, first of all, you have this fix-up. That's the first thing you always have to do. You have to create a place content fix-up. Uh, you know how to do that, you select a fix-up, you set up all of the parameters that you have uh, in there, and then one of the things, of course, is where it all happens. That's that, uh, what is called 03 in my uh, screenshot there. That's the HTML template that you select, right? But what actually happens when you run that? Well, this is what PDF Toolbox does. It takes an input PDF file, and then it's, with that fix-up, run, add something on that PDF document. So the input is a PDF, the output is a PDF with something added. There, that's it. It's really simple. 
Now, when you do that, there is a couple of steps that it goes through. And um, it's not just interesting, it's important to understand what those steps are. So I spell them out. First thing is that, uh, and I, I don't know whether this is all correct from a technical point of view, but this is how I look at it, so you feel free to correct me. Uh, but the first thing is that PDF Toolbox figures out whether you have special requests or not. And to do that, it reads the manifest.xml file that you have. This manifest.xml file is not required. You can delete that from the template if you want. If you delete it, then PDF Toolbox will not do additional stuff for you. Um, but you can put it there. And for example, using the manifest XML, you can ask that PDF Toolbox provides you with ink coverage information, uh, hit information. If you don't know what hit information is, is it on there? Yes. <coughs> So you have a, a property here called apply to. If you have a pre-flight check in there, that pre-flight check will be run. And information about all the hits for that pre-flight check are what can be given to you by PDF Toolbox. But it's, it will only give it to you when you ask for it in the manifest.xml. So that's the first step. PDF Toolbox reads that manifest XML, figures out whether you have special requests, and if you do, it does the necessary to um, fill those requests for you. Second step is what I just said. It provides the information to you. And the way that it's done is that in that Kalas temp folder that I talked about, there is a JSON file. Now, I always say a JSON file, I had actually no idea what that stood for. Uh, it's a JavaScript object notation. So it's basically a JavaScript object that has been written into a file in an easily readable uh, fashion. In that JSON file, you get all the information uh, about the document that is being processed and all the information, the special things that you've asked PDF Toolbox to provide you. So if you look at that JSON file and then you run uh, that fix up that you create and then you look at it again, you'll see that the information reflected changes every time and it reflects what happened during that uh, place content call. <coughs> so that's two. We now have information. Now, this, by the way, this JavaScript file, this .js file, is one, and that is the case in all the samples that are out there already as well. This JSON file can be included in your <coughs> main HTML file. And if you include it in your main HTML file, it means that from within your own scripts, you can access that information about the document. Yeah? So this is how, from within the template, you get access to this information in the JSON, the information that PDF Toolbox writes out for you. The next step is that PDF Toolbox determines what, the, what it is going to do. And basically, well, I called it search for the, the main file, search for the file that is going to be converted into PDF and then placed on top of the processed PDF file. It does not have to be a file that is called index.html. You can just as well take an image, you can take uh, an SVG file, you can take a PDF file. All of those things can be used in place, uh, in place content. Yeah. But of course, the normal case if you want is that you have an index.html file and in that case, that file will be used to uh, be converted. <coughs> but if you ever have a problem, for example, with uh, there is a, a function called overlay, there is a function called add as layer. Uh, if you ever have an example with positioning or exactly how that works and it's too limited, then using place content with a PDF file, for example, is a very good alternative to overlay or, or import as uh, add as layer, I think it's called. It's a very good alternative. It takes the PDF that you put in that folder and it will simply add it on top of the PDF that you're processing. Um, and you have a lot more control over how it adds that. 
So you don't have to use the whole HTML um, template thing if you don't want that or if you don't need it. You can simply use an SVG or an image or a PDF. But what we are what we are doing, of course, will use an, uh, an HTML file. The next thing is actually at that point, PDF Toolbox has all the information it needs. So it will take the main file that it just selected, convert it to PDF if that's necessary, um, and then it has your result file. And what is interesting is that that result file will show up in that color stamp folder as well. So if you ever do something with a template and the result is not what you expected, you can look at the converted file in that colors underscore temp folder and figure out perhaps why. In most cases, you figure out it's either a broken or an empty file and you still don't know anything. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it can actually help you by showing that the generated file is the wrong page size or something like that, or you've done something really stupid, or it's just empty and the objects are outside of the uh, of the file, stuff like that. So if you go to that Kalas underscore temp folder, you'll find the, the file, the PDF that was created uh, here in that folder. And then the last step, of course, is that the PDF that was generated, this decoration PDF, is added on top of the PDF file that you're, uh, that you're processing. And then there is some stuff with the number of pages. If you generate a one-page PDF, but your input document is five pages, it will be repeated uh, five times, so that it's your decoration is added to each page in the incoming PDF, unless you're doing special stuff in your template. Does that still make sense? Me. Um, <coughs> I expected a whole bunch of questions, so we're going to be done in like a third of the time. No, no, no. You can't ask questions. <laughs> so, let's take an example. And I'm <coughs> going to take you through all the steps necessary to um, to build this. What are we going to do? We're going to take this nice, um, <coughs> by coincidence, it's a penguin. Um, I don't know whether this is Austrian, this thing, but it looked kind of. <laughs> I, for some reason, I felt. So I'm going to take, I, I, I'm going to take <coughs> this. This is the incoming file. This is the file that we want to process. Yeah, this is not our template. <coughs> and I want to make that out of it. It's a very common question that we, that we get. Basically, you, get, you have a workflow. Uh, a client, for example, uploads a PDF document. And you want to send back, that's a bottle of something for me from someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, So you want to take that file that comes in, which was this file, and you want to place it on a standard page with some information next to it. And I've seen probably 25 different versions of this, but the main question is almost always the same. How do I build a workflow where a file comes in and what goes out is a proof page that can be printed, an A4 or a letter page, depending which uh, part of the world you're in. I want to get a file that can be printed or that can be sent by email to a client. And it shows what is actually going to be printed. So it shows the incoming file. There could be some size information uh, next to it or any, anything like that. And it shows information that comes out of an MIS system or an ordering system or a web-to-print system or something like that. So this is, this is what we're building for the rest of our time here. <coughs> well, my sessions anyway. How do we do that? 
Who has done this before? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> the proof page. <laughs> okay. And I don't necessarily mean with penguins. There is a, a problem that, you're, that, that we're running into with this. And um, it's easy to solve, but you have to know how. The problem is this slide. What I see here, and that's actually very accurate, is that there is a PDF file coming in. You're processing that PDF document. And the result is a PDF file with some additions. When you use place content in PDF toolbox, you always add decorations to the PDF file that comes in. You cannot change with the place content fix up. You cannot change the number of pages in the incoming file or the page size of the incoming file. Yeah? And that's kind of annoying for what we're trying to build here because we're attempting to go from a file that comes in where we don't exactly know what the page size is. Because of course, we want to build this dynamically. I mean, I'm assuming that we, we have files coming in that potentially have different sizes. So we don't know what the page size is. It is almost certainly not going to be um, the correct size for us to add a background and some additional metadata around it. Yeah, I'd be very surprised by that. But still, we want to convert that to this. Now, you cannot do this only with place content, simply because of this principle. <coughs> whatever the file size is, whatever the page size is that comes in, is also the page size that goes out. Place content will never change that. So if we want to do this, we first have to change the page size of our document that we're processing. And as we can't do that with place content, we have to find a different way to do it. There is multiple ways you could do this with PDF Toolbox. There is only one good one, I think, unless someone has better ideas. But there is multiple ways. You could look at if the file that comes in, you could scale it somehow, and then you could add white space uh, around it. That's actually possibility. Thinking of it, it's actually not a bad possibility. But the easiest way that I've found so far is um, doing that using the imposition engine. And that sounds really annoying. It is really annoying because you have to uh, create a uh, sheet config and, uh, and run this file. But it's very fast. It doesn't require a very complicated imposition uh, setup. So it's actually very easy to, uh, to make. And after that step, we'll end up with an A4 page <coughs> that has our incoming file in the correct spot and still has all the white space we need to add other stuff. There is one additional advantage, and that is that in imposition, using the imposition engine, you can do imposition on a blank sheet, or you can do it on a sheet that already has some graphical content on it. So all of the content that is fixed if you think about this again, all the red stuff that we have in the background, that can be added during the imposition step. You don't have to do that. You can also add it using place content. But it's usually much easier to design this thing in Illustrator or in InDesign or whatever you want to use, save it as a PDF file, and then use that as the background in your imposition step. So we're going to, we're going to do this using the, uh, the imposition uh, engine. What do we need? Well, we need a background file. And as I said, that can be either, well, you don't strictly need it. You can omit that background file, and then you'll have a white page. We need a run list file, and we need a sheet config file. And you need the measurements where you want to put this incoming PDF, of course. So this is what you need. There's all, all kinds of high-tech ways you can do this. Or you can create whatever you want in Illustrator, print it out, and then use a measure to measure where you want the incoming file. And let me tell you, that's often the quickest way to do it. The only thing I found you have to be careful for is if you print it out, your background file, you have to print it out at 100%. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, <laughs> you're going to end up wondering why all the text that you measured ends up in the wrong spots on your final PDF. And 
you're then going to find out that your printer <laughs> scales into 95% automatically and you're going to kick yourself for a while and then you're going to do it as well. So what I've done here is I've created this background in Illustrator. That was the first step. Um, and then secondly, I've measured, it's hard to see probably, but I've, I've simply measured where I want this incoming file to, uh, to end up. If you remember anything from the imposition engine inside of PDF Toolbox, it is that it takes pages and it places those pages in a rectangular area, a slot. So what I'm doing here is identifying where that slot is on my big page. That's the information that I will need to figure out how to create this imposition config. But you're doing this uh, manually. You're doing this in identifying this area, you're identifying it manually. Yes. And I'm it in the user. Yeah. So I've, I've, well, so the other thing you could do, and I thought about that, but this was nicer. Um, the other way you could do is you could design this in Illustrator, draw an object where you want it in Illustrator, and then using the Illustrator coordinates, you can also get the information mm -hmm. for where this has to be. But I find it, I find it easier to, um, I'm not so, <laughs> used to working with Illustrator and so on, so uh, this is easier for, uh, for me. There's all kinds of waving going on in the, in the back, so I'm assuming that that means my time is almost up. Um, we'll just, uh, I'll just give you this and then you can make the imposition config during the break. So we need an imposition config. Right? We need an imposition config of, um, well, we need two things. We need a, a, a .sheet config file and a .remlist file. Those are the two things that you need for a um, for imposition to work. <laughs> this is the complete sheet config file. Huh? So I'm. Uh, when I'm saying that this is a simple imposition config, I'm actually not, I'm not lying to you. This is the complete sheet config file. I'm saying there are two lines, of course it looks like more lines, but I've put them, uh, I've put, well, I've put them on more lines to make them fit on the slide. You shouldn't do that or because it's not going to work. Um, but that's what you need. You have uh, the name of how the thing is going to appear in, in the switchboard. That's the first line. And then the second line is a, single slot that I define and that is that rectangular area where my uh, incoming PDF is going to uh, come into and you can see the measurement so it's at 120 millimeters from the left hand side of the page 120 is this distance from here to there and then 20 millimeters from here to there remember that the origin of the coordinate system is always left bottom of the page, pointing up and pointing to the right. So 120 and 20 and then the width and height in my example are 160 millimeters. You could of course make a version where files that are landscape are put on a, no landscape is like this, Files that are landscape are put on a uh, proof page that is portraits, and files that are portraits are put on a <laughs> config that is landscape. It's complicated, but you could do that, and that, that potentially could give you something that looks a little bit nicer because you have a little bit more uh, real estate to play with. It so happened when I started measuring that my uh, my slot area is rectangle is. Um, is actually square, so I, I lived with that. Uh, it's a happy coincidence. The rest of the stuff is actually very simple. Zero, 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 zero means no bleed. Minus one, minus one means um, scale to fit. That's the important part. So whatever the size of the incoming PDF is, it is always scaled to fit <coughs> in my 160 by 160 millimeter stuff. And then the rest is uh, center, center, and then no trim marks, uh, nothing else that is, uh, that is there. <coughs> yes? When you do scale to fit, uh, is the size of the PDF stand the same, or will be reduced by 
you mean by the size? So in the PDF, you mean file size. File size is 10 meg. It's 10, 10 megs. Of course, yeah. it's scaled. So we don't touch the, we don't do dance sampling or anything like that. Yeah. Scale to fit means you take the size and you change the page size to fit in uh, 160 by 160. If you want to create a version that is low weight yeah, for a proof page, then you can insert an additional fix-up that does downscaling and then places it in there. That would be possible. Okay. But the position engine itself doesn't touch the quality of the, of the PDF it places there. That would kind of be against the, uh, the logic of the position engine. Where is this file stored? Not in this... Uh... No. You don't have that. I'll give you, I can give, I can share the examples afterwards, that's not a problem. Um, I'm going to, I think, do two more slides before uh, we break, which should still be reasonable. This is the run list that you need, and it's not two lines, it's four lines, so um, <coughs> it's a lot more difficult, and actually I think it's uh, it's, however many of these proof pages you want to generate with different layouts, this is actually a fixed file. You don't have to modify it really because what it does is it specifies the name of that thing inside of the switchboard and then it has a new sheet which uh, creates a new sheet. Um, it says posi position page which means that take the page from the incoming PDF and place it into slot number one and then it goes to the next page. Yeah, that's all there is to it. And if you have an incoming PDF file, it will be neatly placed into the slots that we've uh, defined. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I may have one. Uh, I'm not sure that you set the flash size to wait for like, what point, which point you Ah, we don't. Very good. So normally, when you look at an imposition config, yes. So normally, when you when you look at an imposition config, as uh, the examples, the sheet config file will actually contain one additional line. It will have name, and then typically it has something that is uh, starts with sheet, I, I believe, yes, um, and then it has dimensions. Normally, that's where you define that this is going to be an A4 position. Here, we don't do that because we have the sheet config file, we have a run list file, and then we have a PDF file that lives next to it that has the same name as the sheet config file .pdf at the end. And when that file is found, when that PDF file is found, PDF toolbox looks at that PDF and it takes the same page size as that PDF document. Because my PDF document, my background is A4, the sheets that are created here, so when I say new sheets in the, in the run list file, the sheet that is created is automatically in A4. There is a, a little bit of, a, of a, something you have to be aware of as well. If you would define sheets there, so if you would say sheet and then a specific size, um, it would more than likely not use your background. So you define the sheet size either in the file or in the PDF file that lives next to it. What you want to have in the end, so when I go here and I show you this, These are the three files that I'm talking about. Yeah? So the, the sheet config file is that two line file that we just showed. The run list is the, the file with four lines inside. And then you have a file that has the exact same name as the sheet config file, .pdf. Now, be careful if you read the documentation, it sounds like you should name that file proof background a4 landscape.pdf. If you do that, it's not going to find it, and you can beat yourself for a while uh, why it doesn't find it. So it really has to have a double extension. It has to be .sheetconfig.pdf at the end. And the file needs to be next to the sheet config file. It needs to be exactly next to it. If you're using the CLI, that's different. I think you have, def you have 
separate uh, parameters that you can pass on the CLI that say where is the run list, where is the sheet config, and where is the background file. Yes, I think you do. Yes, you do. I'm pretty sure. We can fight about it later, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> And if I uh, show you what is inside, this is the, um, the run list. I have some more lines because I have comments in there. This is the, uh, the sheet config. And that's the PDF document. Uh, you don't see much uh, about that. So if I would go to That's the background document. So this is an A4 document, and it's automatically now going to be used as a background. And you can <coughs> see that anything that is variable is not here. So the Kalas logo is in there because that's always the same thing. But then the, the white text I had there and in the bottom, all the text that I had on the left-hand side, all of that is variable content. So all of that is, is going to be added by place content. But all the elements that are fixed are in my PDF document. Questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Then we're going to take a break, uh, I think. And then after the break, we're making the uh, we're making the uh, the HTML template. <laughs>